Welcome back to Midnight Mirage Productions. So in this video, we will continue talking about the creation of a corporate empire in American professional sports and entertainment as it pertains to professional basketball. We learned a little bit about the early NBA, how it merged with the ABA, acquired the ABA teams and players, and now we have this influx of so-called black American men playing in the NBA, but they also are bringing with them certain habits and a certain behavior that basically is being um, broadcasted to them, marketed and promoted to them in their so-called black communities. And during the 1970s, all the so-called black men that were playing in the NBA, they were being influenced by the so-called black exploitation films that were coming out at that time as well. When you had figures like from Superfly, uh, Shaft, Foxy Brown, etc. Those archetypes in the so-called black community of the pimp, the prostitute, the, the drug dealer, the gangster, the mobster, um, all those other you know street activities and street identities. This is when it was started to be marketed and expressed on a higher level through these movies and films to so-called black Americans. And the men that were in the NBA, they were part of this same era as well. So you would have people like Clyde Drex, uh, not Clyde Drexler, but Walt Clyde Frazier, Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain, um, all, and, you know, numerous other so-called NBA players during the 70s when they would come to the games. They would be dressed in long fur coats like no different than Nicky Barnes or Frank Lucas. They would have on the fur hats like the pimps and the players. They were driving the same kind of vehicles that the mobsters were driving in the black exploitation films. So although they were professional athletes coming to the you know arenas to do their job, they were bringing with them the culture that they you know were growing up in and that was being promoted to them at that time. And with this, you know, that you had drug usage, a lot of cocaine usage. And later on in the 80s, you started to have you know, smoking, you know, the cocaine, but drug usage, uh, certain quote unquote street behavior um, that was prevalent in the so-called black community. And you also had fighting and being aggressive and really a lack of control on the basketball court, because we all know that during playing, playing basketball, there can be arguments and. Um, disputes over a foul or this person traveled, etc. And it can lead to physical co um, confrontations. But you had a lot of the so-called black men bringing that onto the court. So you, you know, the, the game will be going on, but there may be some type of event that will happen and it will lead to a brawl on the court. So we all know about the so-called malice in the palace with Ron Artest, the Pacers and the Detroit Pistons. But that type of behavior, the NBA was you know really introduced to that in the 1970s and they had to figure out how to control and fix this problem because there were a lot of corporate marketing dollars being invested into the um the teams at that time you had a lot of loans maybe that the nba had taken out that they had to pay interest on and pay the loan off at that time the nba wasn't this big business it wasn't like they were breaking in millions and millions and millions of dollars because the NBA primarily makes money from the licensing agreements to broadcast the NBA product, which is the viewing of um, athletic entertainment um, via basketball. OK, so the NBA, they own their product. That's why at the end of certain commercials um, during the NBA halftime, you'll see that, you know, in all licensing and all rights reserved by NBA Corporation, da, 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 da. And at the bottom right of the screen, you'll see that small C with that circle around it. That means that the NBA has copywritten or they have a copyright for that intellectual property. So in order to use it, these different networks that, you know, we watch on these TV stations, they have to make business deals with the NBA and contracts have to be created to where the NBA will agree to give that network the rights to broadcast the NBA game for X amount of years or months however you know much they however long they make the the business deal so for example right now we're used to watching a lot of the games on tnt we're used to watching the games on abc and espn because the nba has licensing deals with them so the business side of the nba they make money from those licensing deals of course their merchandise 
and they make money from you know um really a variety of ways so the business side of the nba is usually what's in the shadows and is hidden and we're going to learn more about that um and how that has an influence and you know control over the game but getting back to what we were saying in the 1970s you had these um you know these problems in the nba so they had to bring in david stern to clean some of that stuff up so let's let's start from the top and, and that's what they mean by those dark periods so i'll be putting a conclusion on that when they talk about those early days in the nba and the dark periods they talk about the 1970s when they start letting so-called black american men play in the nba and trying to figure out how can we broadcast and use their talent and at the same time make it friendly for the viewership that's the general public throughout the united states of america and then later on internationally so they were trying to figure out how do we do that and then they had to you know bring in david stern who was a lawyer and he knew how to create you know laws basically for the nba and for the players so let's let's read about this he said instead of marketing the league's teams he changed the focus to his star players such as magic johnson and larry bird and michael jordan and charles barkley from the 1980 draft which was held soon after stern took office jordan's arrival in particular ushered in a new era of commercial bounty for the nba with him came his flair and talent for the game and that brought in shoe contracts from nike which helped to give the league even more national attention so we're going to, you know, of course, go into Jordan a little bit later on because he has to have his own thing. But what was happening is that the players were being marketed in these dualities and these rivalries. So, you know, keep in mind that once the NBA merged with the ABA, the late 70s, early 80s, even prior to that, the Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers have always been the pillars of the NBA the two teams on the east and west coast that would be the premier teams and they would always you know in one way or another be either getting ready to go for a championship or just have won a championship and the rivals were going to be between boston and, and la all right so what the nba behind the scenes people always had to do is make sure certain players were drafted to boston even if they had won a championship the year before so, um, like another example, even the Lakers, like when the Lakers were drafted, Magic Johnson, James Worthy, and these seasons where these players were being drafted, the prior year, the Lakers were winning either championships or had good records. So when it came to the draft lottery and the rights to choose the number one pick, they should have been further down to have that opportunity because they were good in a prior year. But there were a lot of, you know, things done behind the scenes to control and make sure that these two teams always had players so they could either be in the hunt for a championship and already or already have won one because these were large high marketed teams and players that were going to be on these you know east and west coast so keep that in mind too and a lot of us know that already that boston and los angeles these two teams are the pillars of the nba no matter what year it is the nba was built off these teams but Later on, the business model started to change into, well, now we got the teams, but we need to start marketing certain players and we have to market them in these rivalries that come from the East and the Western Conference. So, of course, in the 80s, we know about Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. And this was, you know, a good rivalry and it worked because in order for the rivalry to work, you have to have organic talent, meaning those offensive and defensive packages you have to have them you have to actually be a good basketball player you have to have the certain personality and charisma the way you express yourself the way you socialize and interact with the public and the fans uh the business partners you know if you can be corporate friendly then they know they could use you and you could be somebody that's worthy and safe to invest all these millions and millions of corporate dollars of marketing and promotion etc and they can get a return on them. But if you're one of these players that they can't trust and you bring in too much of that, you know, so-called uh, Negro behavior, then it, it can mess the investment up. All right. It can mess the investment up. So Magic Johnson, he had that personality 
and he had the skill set and he could be trusted. So that rivalry with him and Larry Bird, you know, it started from their college days. And of course, we know it continued into the NBA. But once it got to Michael Jordan, he was an individual player that they could market. Um, and the business model with Michael Jordan, it was going to be Michael Jordan versus the NBA. So all of the teams and the star players from those teams, <clears throat> they're all the antagonists against Michael Jordan, the protagonist, the star athlete. But we'll we'll get to that later on. It says Stern guided the league through dwindling viewership in route to global growth. In his first year as commissioner, Stern offered Adrian Paenza, a South American basketball and soccer analyst, and Argentina Channel 9 the rights to air weekly NBA highlights for 2000 a year. So what David Stern did is night and what is was excuse me. David Stern, yes, he made this business deal with a basketball and soccer analyst and, and also Argentina channel channel nine to air NBA games for two thousand dollars a year. All right, so these this is one of his early business deals. But remember I said that's how the NBA makes money. They make money from giving these networks and broadcasting agencies and businesses the rights to air the NBA games. Because if you try to use you know, some some way to hack and and, and air an NBA game, they're going to flag you for a copyright. Just like people that may make a YouTube video and it may be, let's say, a Patrick Ewing documentary they're making. But if you use in some of the NBA's material and they've copywritten it and they got that small C next to, you know, whatever the name of the product is, they can flag you for a copyright violation for using their intellectual property because you didn't set some type of a business deal up to uh, license it and or lease it and or or you didn't outright pay them for it to, to own it so if you don't own the intellectual property that's what they're going to do so you that's that business deal that the nba set up with channel nine so channel nine in argentina obviously is some type of a broadcasting station so david stern got in contact with them or vice versa and they came up with a business deal so david stern said okay look we got all these nba games we got you know, the Spurs versus the Lakers. We got all these different teams. We're going to allow you all to air these teams. Uh, I mean, excuse me, air these games on your broadcasting network. So the people in your area and everybody who watches your broadcasting network, they'll have access to these NBA basketball games. All right. So that's a business deal. So just keep that in mind, because also we want to learn about professional sports and entertainment. But we want to learn about the business aspect of this, too, because maybe it's some type of business you want to create in sports and entertainment. Uh, so you should be learning some of that, you know, behind the scenes business stuff as well as we're talking about all this. So let's continue on. Um, so the next thing that we're going to do now is I want to talk about um, a little bit more about that control aspect of the professional athlete. Because once David Stern, he came in, they set up these different NBA rules. Of course, one of them was the drug testing. So now you've cleaned up and gotten rid of that that 75 percent that they allege. And one out of 10 that they allege was either using cocaine or using uh, or smoking cocaine. So they've cleaned that up once, you know, the 80s came. Because even in Michael Jordan, he said this in the last dance documentary that when he was drafted in 84, that players were still, you know, drinking liquor and partying and doing certain things, taking, you know, the drugs, because we'll talk about land bias even in, in the future. But, you know, that still was going on even. So th this stuff, the NBA really didn't get everything like they wanted until the 1990s. And it really started in that 90, 91 season. That's, that was like the birth of them really taking off. And, of course, we know a lot of that had to do with Michael Jordan. But as I said, we'll go into that in another take. So, you know, once the, the, the 70s, the 80s came, the NBA realizes, like, all right, these Caucasian American United States guys, they're, they're, they're pretty good, um, you know, because Larry Bird organically is a good basketball player. But they were noticing that predominantly it was the aboriginal so-called black American. He was 
the one that seemed to have the talent on a more average, you know, pervasive level. Um, more of the star athletes, you know, were coming from this ethnic national group. So they learned that we're going to have to make sure that we can have a friendly relationship, you know, still going to be manipulation involved. But we're going to have to be able to get along with these so-called black American men and do business with them because they're the ones bringing the talent and the skill set. So I want you to think about the relationship of, you know, the star NBA player. He's the athlete. And a lot of the people who are watching the games that are buying the merchandise that are doing business with the NBA, they're doing it because they want to watch the players and you know, they like the basketball skills that these players have. So these players are making the NBA a lot of money. Like, let's take like John Morant, for example. You know, I'm just keep using him because his situation is current right now. John Morant makes them a lot of money. So, you know, they have a certain way that they deal with these situations when, you know, a player may get in trouble with the law or may get in trouble with the public by not looking politically correct in some area and if they know that this will mess up a lot of the marketing and advertisement it'll turn away some of these corporations then what the nba will do is they'll quickly send in their agents and their different officials to clean these situations up to pay off maybe whoever they need to pay off and keep this quiet in the media because there's a relationship between the nba office and the media as well so these basketball players who you know, are generating a lot of revenue for the NBA. They can't allow just, you know, any old type of information to come out about them. You know, so they're very, very careful of how they deal with them. And there are tons and tons of examples that will unfold as time goes on. So. You have the star athlete and he's generating all this revenue. He's he's attracting all this viewership. He's bringing all these licensing deals. There has to be some type of control because he's making too much money. So the people behind the scenes that ultimately are in control, not necessarily of the players, but they're in control of the realm of the players, the activities of the players. In other words, they're the ones that create the matrix or the reality that the players live in. So I won't say that, you know, these, you know, the, the, the NBA doesn't own these men. These men are, you know, their own people, but they do control, like I said, the matrix that they live in. So you have the NBA team ownership. So we have what, 32 teams in the NBA split between the Eastern and Western Conference. And all these teams are owned by individual men who are businessmen. So remember, the NBA is its own business in its own independent corporation and the NBA teams, they're their own business and independent corporations and they're in partnership. OK, so when we think about the Atlanta Hawks, the Boston Celtics, the Charlotte Hornets, the New York Knicks, the Houston Rockets, the Indiana Pacers, all these individual businesses are in partnership with the NBA and they have their own owners and their own administration. OK. So, for example, um, the Los Angeles Lakers, they were owned by that man, Jerry Buss. But when he passed on, uh, I think his his children have it now, Jenny Buss and her brothers. So they're owned by the Buss family. And that Los Angeles Lakers business corporation owned by the Buss family is in partnership with the NBA and the front office and uh, Adam Silver and his board of directors and board of governors. So that's the relationship. So. You have the NBA team ownership. You have the NBA team executives. So that's the general management, uh, the assistant coaches, the strength and conditioning coaches, etc. The various NBA corporate executives. So that's the NBA front office. When I say the front office, I mean, you know, the NBA commissioner, uh, the NBA vice president and all those different divisions like the marketing department, etc. That's the NBA front office, um, the NBA corporate executives. But you also have the music entertainment executives involved because I want you all to think about, like, for example, I remember watching a basketball game and during halftime they were playing that hot song by Young Thug and Gunner. In order for them to do that, the NBA corporation has to 
reach out to Gunner and Young Thug's company, whoever owns that intellectual property, the, the content, the copyrights to their music. They have to contact them and the NBA has to pay them a licensing agreement to use that music and put it in the NBA commercials during the halftime or, you know, when the NBA makes its productions. So what will happen is, is they'll call, you know, Gunner and Young Thug's company. They'll say, hey, we want to use this song and then, you know, this commercial and we want to use it for the entire NBA season and we'll do it for, you know, I'm going to just make some up, um, you know, let's say 700,000 and then they'll wire 700,000 uh, direct deposit to Young Thug and Gunner's company. So they can now have the licensing rights to play that song hot in their different NBA commercials. And of course, the NBA production team, they're going to edit in, you know, Jason Tatum Duncan as he's playing against the Miami Heat as they get ready for game seven to see who goes to the NBA finals representing the Eastern Conference. So when they make that whole production, that music that they put in it, they have to have a relationship with the music entertainment executives. So that's why they're involved in the NBA business as well. Of course, you got the different marketing divisions from various corporations, the bar association, legal representation and all the lawyers. Because remember, the business of the NBA is um, is entertainment law. Like a lot of the agents for the NBA. Have backgrounds in entertainment law. So the same kind of lawyer that a musician or a so-called rapper would have. That entertainment law foundation is the same background that a lot of the athletes have as well. It's just the athletes, you know, the, the sports business is different from, of course, the music. So the contracts are going to have different elements and details that their lawyers should look out to make make sure is in there. Like, for example, how a basketball player, he could have an injury, but you still want to make sure that your player or your client rather could receive certain type of money even if he does have an injury so you're going to make sure that that's constructed within the contract whereas with an entertainment lawyer for a musician they're not doing physical activity so that element is not going to be necessarily in the contract it may be something about you know um the rights to the music or publishing etc okay you have political and government representation believe it or not the government you know federal government they are involved behind the scenes, okay? And they have their own representation involved. And once again, I'm just naming different forces and entities that have control and influence either directly or indirectly over the NBA players because they're vested financially or politically in the NBA. Law enforcement and military representation and international representation. So you have all these different um, key business partners involved in the entertainment business of professional basketball via the nba so those are the forces that really have the control and influence on you know the the, the nba the games and what some people call quote-unquote rigging which really to me is just it's just corporate control it's not rigging it's corporate control so the way the nba marketing goes is as i've said before or I hinted at rather. The best player isn't always going to be the top marketed player. So when you look at the, you know, corporate sports media and they have their different sports analyst shows, whoever you see them talking about the most and giving the most airtime, giving the most attention, whether this person's team wins or not, whether this man wins MVP or has a good you know, field goal percentage, none of that stuff really matters. Whoever you see them giving the most attention to, this is the person that A, has a certain organic skill set that the NBA knows is real raw talent, and B, has the personality, mentality, and background that shows they can be controlled and manipulated the way that the corporate NBA business partners would see fit. So at the end of the day, they can make their returns and profits on all the revenues. OK, so. That's ultimately. um, You know, who, who's really behind the scenes? It's, it's all the people that are involved in making money, you know, from the um, the NBA product, which is all the players playing the game. So. We wanted to 
continue upon what we learned in the first tape in the creation of the corporate empire. But we had to talk a little bit more about, you know, the background on the business. Now I want to talk about the difference and understanding the difference rather between organic, natural, athletic skills and gifts and corporate manipulation. Because as I said, the, the person that the NBA promotes and markets the most, sometimes they may be the best NBA basketball player and sometimes they may not. And that even is included with the person that wins the NBA MVP. OK, so if the NBA may have an agenda, let's say, like currently, if I can remember correctly, the last few MVPs have been international foreign players, meaning guys who are not aboriginal to the to the Americas, North America um, or nor are they, you know, Caucasian descent, United States citizens. So you got who, who uh, Joel and B won this year. And I think he's from so-called West Africa. Uh, Nikola Joker, he's from, what, Eastern Europe. And you also had uh, Luka Doncic that plays in Dallas, and he's from Eastern Europe. So you have these international people who have been winning the MVP. Now, me personally, when it comes to the top centers in the NBA, I do think that the Joker is the best center. You know, he has a, a, a good package, offensively especially. You know, his defense, it can improve. And um, I think his rim, rim protection, I want to see him pipe, pipe up more of that. But as far as his dribbling abilities, being able to bring the ball up the, court, up the court off of a defensive rebound, those are good. His passing abilities from the top of the key or at the post are good. And, of course, his skill set on, you know, low post moves, that little floater he has. Um, you know, he has a good package. So... The, what what the NBA really loves is when, you know, they'll have an international player who's actually good and he can rise to that level. And of course, we also know Giannis up in Milwaukee. He's a um, Grecian. He's of a Shemitic, I think, Shemitic, Hamitic, Grecian descent. So, you know, and he won the MVP. So what's happening is, is a lot of the Aboriginal North American players, um, if they're not careful, when it comes to the marketing and the promotion and advertising, if if you know if we can't if we can't stay focused basically on the professional game of basketball the right way and continue to, to work at the craft and develop it the right way and not cheat the game, not try to make it easy and go from team to team, you know, doing a bunch of crying and making excuses, you know. We, we, we got to just get back to that, that strict mentality and, and that will to win. And um, I'll probably talk about that in the next tape. But we continue in our series learning, doing our background work. Stay tuned. I'm out.